Creative Cows DSLR Essentials Podcast. I'm Robbie Carmen, And I'm Rich Harrington. You know, Rich, it happens to the best of us, right? You go out and you shoot something and you think everything's hunky-dory and you come back and you load the footage on the computer and you go, oh no. You have clips that are really dark and underexposed and you might have some clips that are overexposed. Yeah, you know, I never personally had. Oh, because you're perfect. I know exactly. That, right, yes. <laughs> yeah, no, I, it's actually I, I bought a magic camera. Oh, you did buy. I, I hear those are a little more expensive than the. They uh, do, the but they models. don't have those exposure problems. Yeah. <laughs> now everyone faces exposure problems, and it's sort of amplified by the fact that you know the screen we're looking at in the back here. Yep. Even if you're using the loop, it's kind of hard to judge because you don't have a waveform or a histogram. And I know you like to say your eyes lie. Your eyes do lie, yeah. And I mean, in previous episodes, we've talked about the importance of monitoring, even using an external monitor, so you could bring up scopes and judge your exposure and color and that kind of stuff. But even still, you know, from time to time, you're going to miss, you know, you're going to miss a shot or two. You know? Yeah, and it's sometimes, sometimes it's actually by design. Like you're faced with a situation where, you know, because these cameras have sort of a limited range, and we're shooting an eight bit, you know, it's not a ten bit or a twelve bit Kodak, and you're looking at that, and you're like, well, do I expose for the person? and let the sky blow out. You get out. caught in between stops and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. yeah. So sometimes it's not your fault or it's a choice. And I guess what we're going to look at today is if it's better to shoot underexposed or overexposed. And, you know, we're going to sort of bypass the camera altogether and jump right into some NLEs yep. and talk about how we deal with these situations. And I think by the end of the episode, you're going to have a clear favorite method if you're faced with that, do I overexpose or underexpose? Yep. Because we're going to show you which method's better. Yeah, of course. So, yeah, let's jump in here. I'm on a uh, a system running Final Cut Pro, and yep. I've just imported uh, a couple clips in here. And let me just play through this first clip, and you can see it's just audio, uh, video only clip. And uh, you can tell it's uh, pretty. Dark. I think there's people there. You think there's people there, right? Yeah. Um, and this was shot under a challenging lighting condition. It was actually on a mission trip, and yep. you know they're in a low light situation, and it's not like they say, "Oh, let's bring in the generator truck." Right. So you know, at first look, you know, at first blush, you might say to yourself, "Oh man, I can't use this shot at all." And my general feeling with underexposed clips is that, yeah, there's some times where you might just go, it's not even worth it. Because one of the things that happens with underexposed clips, really underexposed clips, is that as you lighten that clip up, you're also lightening that noise floor that's just inherent to any camera. So you might yeah. get up, you might end up with a clip that's just even more offensive because of the noise you end up with. But, you know, in this example, I think that we can actually get this clip to look quite a bit better. Is it going to be perfect? Probably not, but we can get it to be much more usable and to flow with the other clips that are in this project. So, And Robbie is a colorist by trade, so I tend to trust him when he tells me he can fix it. <laughs> yeah. So let's take a look at this clip. Again, I'm in here in Final Cut Pro, and I just got this timeline. I'm just going to go ahead and double-click on this first clip, load it up into my viewer. Then I'm going to come up to the effects menu, and then down to video filters, color correction, and let's choose the color corrector three-way. Very an, versatile. Right. There's another color corrector, which I like to refer to as the color corrector one-way. But the <laughs> color corrector three-way gives me control over the three major areas of the tonal range, shadows, midtones, and highlights. So I'm going to choose that one. And in just a second, I get a new tab up here in my viewer called Color Corrector 3-Way. And here you can see I have some nice, big, shiny color wheels. Right now, we're not going to deal with anything color. We're literally just dealing with the contrast, the lightness and uh, the darkness information in the clip. And, and to just sort of define it for folks at home, you know, the shadows are sort of covering the bottom 20, 25%. Yeah, and there's and the midtones are sort of right in the middle, and the and the, high, uh, the whites or the highlights are the upper part. And there is overlap between them. It's not a perfect, you know, hard line between them. And that overlap makes it, you know, easier to adjust, you know, subtle changes between the clip. Right. So the first thing I'm going to do in this clip is I'm going to come into my white's contrast slider. The contrast sliders are just these guys right below each one of the color wheels. And then I'm just going to drag up quite a bit, something like that. All right. Poof. There's I, people. I can see people now, right? <laughs> and let's come into the midtones and drag up a little bit, something like that. Now, the thing about this, Rich, is that I'm doing this completely blind, right? As you mentioned a minute ago, my eyes lie. And there's actually two problems, right? My eyes lie. And I can, you know, based on my environment and what kind of day I've had, I might not be able to tell what's really going on with this clip. So I need something to help me with that. But the other issue is that even though we're, for this podcast, color correcting on this computer, 
if you have the ability to color correct an on, on an external calibrated broadcast monitor, you need to do that because every computer display is going to be different. They're not going to show you the full range of contrast and color information that's available in the signal. And so you go and you end up color correcting something on your computer, you give it to a client who's watching it on a fancy display and they're going to go, what's, uh -huh. what's <laughs> this? This looks weird, right? right? So when possible, try to, try to uh, uh, color correct on a broadcast monitor. But to help the first point about my eyes line, what I'm actually going to do is come up here to the window menu and down to arrange, and let's choose the color correction uh, arrangement here. And when I do that, over here you can see that I have my video scopes. And we've talked about this briefly when we talked about external monitoring in a previous episode, that scopes are a way of simply allowing you to sort of have an analytical view or measurement of what's really going on in the video signal. And in this place, we're going to be mainly concerned with the waveform monitor, right? Right. So I'm going to jack this up so it's a little brighter so we can see all the squiggly white stuff here. It's called the trace. And what I'm going to do is switch over to the waveform monitor. And the way the wa waveform monitor works is that it goes from a scale that's black or 0% up to white or 100%. Yep. And it mimics the actual picture going left to right. So this part of the waveform over here is this part of the picture right here and so on and so forth. And the distance from bottom to top uh, represents the different, you know, is the tonal range. So looking at this, as I adjust some of my controls here, as I drag that highlight slider up, you'll notice that the top portion of the trace extends up closer to white, right? Because the whites or the highlights are influencing the top of the tonal range uh, more than the other controls. And you don't really want to go above that line or else you're going to have broadcast safe issues. Right. Generally speaking, uh, trace that's above 100% or 100 IRE and trace that's below 0% is generally considered illegal for broadcast, but it also has a factor of to do you know, with what time of day it was, the general mood you're going for. There's not strict and hard rules that says white has to be 100 and black has to be 0. Right. You just don't want to go past those numbers, but you know, in this case, you know, this is an interior in a shadowy sort of situation, so white's around 90% might be accurate. Yeah, so I might drop that down a little bit more so I'm not blowing out those highlights quite as much. Maybe amp up the midtones just a touch. Now, this shot's kind of interesting. You notice that um, this person's dark skin and then these, these dark sweatshirts here, the blacks still look crushed to me. They still look too, too black. Now, this is kind of a matter of taste. I mean, a lot of colorists look at this and say, well, I want the bottom of the trace here to be touching 0%, so something in the image is represented as black. In this case, I kind of feel that we're losing a lot of the shadow detail here. So I'm going to come into the shadows or the blacks contrast slider and drag up just slightly to return some of that shadow detail there, something like that. And let's maybe back off the highlights a touch. All right. Now, the one thing, you know, this clip is looking better. Let me toggle this off so you can see before yep. and after. It's certainly usable. It's certainly much usable. One of the interesting things about the Color Corrector 3-Way and the color science that's used in Final Cut Pro um, uh, uses color space known as YCBCR, right? And that means that brightness or contrast information is separate from color. And when you lighten a clip excessively, like we just did here in the Color Corrector 3-Way, one of the things that happens is that as you lighten it up, if there's a perceptual loss of saturation, right? Right, because pe your people are going to sort of lose that flesh tone in their skin. Yeah, exactly. So when I brighten a clip up considerably, one of the other things that I'll do is simply just come in to this overall saturation slider here and drag up just a touch just to bring some of that warmth and color back into their face. And again, if I toggle this on and off, you can see that it's a noticeable difference. And the last thing, of course, is that I never want to correct just one frame, right? right? It's not smart just to stay on one frame and go, oh, I nailed it. So it's always a good idea just to back it up and you know, play through and make sure that the clip is how you want it. Yep, great. Well, let's go ahead and take another look at a different application. And instead of using a three-way color corrector, we'll tackle this with curves. Cool. And we'll also see how different computers interpret the same footage differently. Yeah, absolutely. So Rich, I see you're here in Adobe Premiere Pro on a PC. Premiere yep. Pro is a popular application, runs on Mac and PC. And Cross-platform. Yeah, and people might already actually have it, just not aware that they have it, because it's part of the Adobe Creative Suite. Yep. You know, so if you use Photoshop or some of those other apps, it's a, it's a good choice to go to. Yeah, and I brought this clip in, and you see on the left the way it interpreted the shot. It's dark, not quite as dark as how Final Cut saw it. And I think some of that has to just do with how H.264 gets interpreted different machines. And this, this is a really great point, because it brings up the point again about using a calibrated broadcast, you know, monitor with you know compatible I/O, you know, to, to get to that monitor because, you know, here on the on the Mac it looked pretty dark and yep. it looked you know extremely darker than that. And again, that's just how. To do but it with doesn't the, matter until we see how it looks on the broadcast monitor. Exactly, there, <laughs> it has a lot to do with the differences between you know the the profiles that the monitors are using, yep. you know, color sync on the Mac and whatever PC is using and back and forth. So. 
I see here that you've already started to uh, correct this clip with uh, the fast color corrector, which is similar to what I was doing in, uh, in Final Cut. And actually, Premiere Pro even has the equivalent of the three-way color corrector, yeah. or color corrector three-way, they call it the three-way color corrector. Yes. <laughs> and we'll do this real quickly here with the fast color corrector, then we'll take a look at Luma Curves. Cool. And what you see here is, you know, I basically sort of did what you did, is I went to the input levels and started to pull that in, and that's basically clipping the white, and it starts to raise what's white in the scene there. You see it's getting brighter. Sure. And then we lifted the mid-tones there with the middle sliders. Yep. And same thing, if you go too far, it starts to, you know, blow out. Yep. But we're using the scope down there, and then we, you know, we clip the blacks here, which sort of actually pushes them back. We're down. not clipping; you're, you're crushing the blacks. Crushing little, them. Yeah, crushing the blacks to yeah. put a little bit more definition back into the image. So that's certainly brighter, and yep. that's fine. That's one way of doing it. Yep. Uh, one other thing that I like to do for really dark footage sometimes is I'll use a curve. Yep. So we can come on over here and just type in the word curves, and the Luma curve well suited for brightness issues, obviously. Yeah, this is one of the things I love about Premiere Pro. Um, and if you're a Photoshop user or, you know, uh, or it was comfortable with curves, curves are a great tool because the entire tonal range is represented along the length of the curve. And by adding control points, you can essentially remap that part of the tonal range. Yeah, and you see there it's nice and gentle. So we put a nice lift in the middle. Yep. And then we could start to sort of, you know, flatten out the whites a little bit there. And that's doing a nice job of brightening up the scene while not blowing out the difference between the sort of the tan wall and the white sign. Absolutely. Now, it's, it's kind of interesting to note, if you are a Final Cut Studio user, um, while Final Cut Pro doesn't have curves native, per se, um, a lot of people, and we don't have, uh, we're not going to do it in this particular episode, but you could also send a project, if you're a Final Cut Studio user, over to Color, which is Apple's dedicated color correction application yeah. that does have curves similar to the curve you're displaying here in Premiere Pro. And, and you see they did a nice job. And yep. absolutely, you can do the same thing in Color. And I think that's an important thing to note. It doesn't really matter which software you use. It's knowing which effect or plugin to choose. And there's a lot of similarity. Yep. The, the last mode that I sort of resolve, if I have a shot that's really dark, mm -hmm. I'll sometimes just duplicate a shot. Yep. You know, and what we can do here, let's just go back to sort of a normal editing workspace real quick. Okay. And I'm just going to copy the video portion. Yep. Copy, we'll paste it down here. Yep. And with two copies, you could put one on top of itself. Okay. And so we'll just sort of split that out and shove it down there. Not worrying about the audio, it's fine. Yeah, it's just replacing <laughs> itself. Yep. You know, and this is sort of uh, the last desperate fix. On that top copy, you could change the blending mode. Ah, yeah. And so if you go under there, you'll see under opacity, we can go to something like screen or lighten. Yep. Or even add. Yeah, add, add would work pretty well. And, and you if you're familiar with Photoshop, these are the same types of blending modes. Just a way of having uh, pixels of the top image interact with pixels of the bottom image. And so add would add the two together. Yeah, so there's the before versus the after with screen. And, and I kind of like that. I mean, because it's it's respecting some of the saturation and the color, and it's yep. just going after the brighter well, it's values. it's great too, because if you're, if you're not, you know, the best with some of these color correction tools, I mean, pretty easily you can figure out how to right yeah. click and choose, you know, blend mode or whatever, or, or double click it and load it into the, uh, the source monitor. Yeah, and, that's, that's and when I hit use. play, it's actually a real time effect here in Premiere Pro. Other that's apps right. you have to render, yep. but it's very quickly, we're seeing, you know, that worked. And so, I kind of reserve that, like as a motion graphics designer, one of the things we often say is, you know, blend mode or the secret sauce or the magic yep. to design. Well, they can also save your butt. Well, you know, the other thing that's interesting, just to put it into perspective for some people, I'm sure a lot of people who have edited or started to edit over the years, one of the things that they've probably done is the same kind of thing with audio, right? They've doubled up audio because audio is sort of a cumulative effect. The more, you know, of one clip yeah. that you have, it's the louder it's going to sound. And and that's it's a similar process. Yeah. We're, we're adding pixels as opposed to boosting pixels. Yep. Yeah. Now, the one thing I we mentioned when we started this episode, the one thing, and it's not so bad on this clip, but the one thing that does happen with really underexposed clips is the potential for noise. Yep. And, you know, one of the things I'll say to people is, you know, it's a subjective thing. It's about how much noise you can put up with or your client can put up with. But if, you know, there are options out there for fixing really noisy clips. You, you can know, go to After Effects, Neat Video, neat video. Color. A Magic Bullet has a plugin now, the guys at Red Giant Software. So there are tools if you're dealing with, you know, excessively noisy clips that you can clean that up a little bit. Well, that's part one on how to deal with over and underexposed footage. Obviously, a lot to learn here. I think one lesson is shoot it right, but you can't always control that. You know, there is unfortunately a fix it in post mentality. Absolutely. I mean, you know, don't rely on fixing it in post. Obviously, I, you know, I, I like to see things when I'm working in my suite that are shot well. But yeah, there is a lot that we can do to fix 
uh, fix the problematic clips for sure. Great. So be sure to turn into part two where we're going to tackle the issue of how do we deal with an overexposed clip and we'll help you sort of make that over under decision for your shooting styles. Thanks again for joining us. My name is Rich Harrington. And I'm Robbie Carmen. And head on over to creativecow.net where you can check out the DSLR forum as well as a ton of other HD podcasts. Thanks again.